So the report into our isolation facilities and quarantining told us basically what we knew and saw with Thelma and Louise. Of course, it hasn't been up to scratch. The system's under extreme stress. Demand was outgrowing supply. There needed to be better oversight of passengers as they were transferred in better day three and day 12 testing. Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern is with us. A very good morning to you. You forgot that it was also doing what it needed to do there, Mike. Apart from the time that it wasn't doing what it was needing to do. Hence Which the has report. been addressed, Mike. So uh, it's all fixed. Was the whole point that we put the report in place was to make sure uh, that we were aware of any other underlying issues and that we tighten those up, and we are. Uh, you accept them as your failings, though? Uh, Mike, I'm going to take one quick step back here for a little bit of global context. There is no rule book on any of what we are doing. In fact, New Zealand, by the mere fact we have quarantine, puts us amongst only a handful of countries in the world. The fact that we mandate testing in those facilities makes us the most stringent in the world when it comes to our border. And so, yes, as we have moved through, we have changed and added on extra requirements to keep tightening those up. Keep in mind, though, we have had a 73% increase relative to April on the number of people coming in. Around the world, we now have 10 million cases and half a million deaths. In South Asia, this pandemic isn't set to peak until July, and we have huge growth in the United States. It is growing, not slowing. It is going to continue to be an issue that happens around us. And New Zealand, in amongst all of that, is doing really well. Of the 2,159 people who were let out without a test, this goes back to last week's question, there's 427 who are still to be contacted, 92 of them are invalid phone numbers. Can we say that the chances of ever contacting those and getting the answers required aren't, isn't going to happen and the horse is bolted? So you're right, the 427 people that we have made repeated contact with, they've had text messages, they have had multiple phone calls, uh, and, and keep in mind as well that these, these are individuals who had completed 14 days of quarantine, had were, cleared a medical check on departure, but happened to not have had a test on top of that. So those 427 people are still being asked so that the purpose is of belts and braces to go and have a test. But there is, at the same time, there is not a clinical concern around them. Right. So the answer to the original question, how many have been tested, we're never going to know, are we? Uh, no, no, we do know. So we know that um, 1,253 people of the 2,159 were contacted and uh, tested uh, negative. Uh, that there are 427, as you say, that we've repeatedly made contact for with 342 are referred to a test and are just waiting on their results. So we actually do, of the people who are released, we do have an answer for each of them. Are you going to need to look at immigration law if the number of people coming back into the country becomes too great? Uh, so not, not, a, not immigration law per se, because keep in mind we've actually really we've really narrowed who can come in. It's citizens and permanent residents, people who have that legal right to be here. Yeah, but there's too many uh, of them. Well, again, we it's, we can't deny the ability... No, I know that. Hence, you're going to offshore, have to look at the law. If you got stuck offshore, you would have every expectation to be able to come in. We have been able to manage the numbers coming in. You're right to say it's put strain, but in part, that hasn't just been the scale. It's been the time that we have once uh, uh, passengers board. We basically don't get a passenger manifest to know how many are coming to the doors close. So it's not been so much the scale, it's been the amount of time we then have to prepare mm. for it. Now, so that means there are things we can do. So we're considering uh, not, not having to cut off people's eligibility, but just ways that we can get a bit more information sooner so we can then manage the flow. Will you potentially have to stall them, for example? No, no, it's more, more around whether or not there's things that we can do at the time that people are booking flights to get information earlier. So there's a few different whether or not... So no matter how many New Zealanders who are entitled to come home, and I'm not arguing they're not entitled to come home, I'm just saying if too many look, say, we're on a border plane tomorrow, you think you can cope? Well, well, what you're asking is, on the flip side there, Mike, what you're asking is that we put a restriction on New Zealanders' ability... No, I'm just to asking whether we will need to. I mean, if you literally well, can't put somebody somewhere, you can't put somebody somewhere, can you? Well, no, that's right. But then that just means staging when they're able to come. That's what I'm saying. So you all. can stall yes. them. Well, you can for things like repatriation flights. Then you do have a bit of control there. Um, and if you're starting to connect the issue of quarantine with booking on flights, then you can start to manage your flow. So there are plenty of options that don't require us to change the law. A lot of these people coming home are owing money for student loans and you're chasing none of it. Why? 
Well, actually, I haven't seen a full breakdown of how many that there would are thousands. Necessarily, they'd necessarily be, Mike. Um, once they come back into the country, they don't pay interest. But what you're referring to is the fact that in our system, if, you, if you're in New Zealand, you don't pay interest on your loan. If you go overseas, then it accumulates. Correct. Uh, I don't think it's fair to say that we don't chase people for their student loans. Well, we rang the IRD last week to say how many have come back. Their answer was thousands. And then we asked how much have you collected, and the answer was none. So the idea, though, that you're suggesting that we would collect instantly on upon return to New Zealand, that is something that as soon as, as someone who signs into um, a job, um, they are automatically deducted when they are in New Zealand for their student loan debt. So will you chase them if they try to leave the country or prevent them leaving the country with debt? I'd need to refresh my memory, but there are things that kick in at border control when you have debt, um, Mike, but I wouldn't want to give you off the top of my head. Aren't you exercised by it? It's hundreds of millions of dollars and we need hundreds of millions of dollars. Mike, as I just said, once someone comes back into the country and they have student loan debt, as soon as they get a job, we automatically deduct from their wages their debt. And if they don't get a job? Well, of course, we're working very hard to make sure everyone does. Um, If they don't have a job, obviously the income that they receive will be so low that it makes it very hard for them to pay off their debt. Ihamata, is a deal coming this week or no? I've never put a timeline on it, Mike, but you know that it's something I've been wanting to resolve. Buy? Again, haven't put a timeline on it. It's been, and let's be honest, it has taken a very, very, very long time. It was a year ago that we had occupation on the land, um, but there's a number of issues that have obviously needed to be worked through, and not all of them have just been by the government, including those mana whenua who have an interest in the land. Indeed. I'm told it's this week. Is that incorrect? Oh, well, that'd be news to me to put a precise date on it there, Mike. So, again, so will there be something before the election? Because it is... I'm not being flippant, it is something that we want to resolve, but I have no set timeline for you. Okay, so there's nothing new to report then in that case? Not today, right. not today, no. Have you, did you look at the pictures last week of Ashley Bloomfield when your Minister of Health threw him under the bus so publicly? I, I did, I did see that interview, but also I also know the full transcript of what happened in the interview and the elements that weren't included included uh, Dr Clark talking about what an exceptional public servant Ashley was. What did you see in Ashley's face? Well, the same that I've seen across people who are working in health generally, you know, a group of people who've worked exceptionally hard for a number of months um, and that we do need to give some respite to. They have been working incredibly hard, which is why, uh, Mike, we've been criticising, we've been criticised for not directly blaming any individual person because this has been a failure of our system and we've all taken collective responsibility for that. Did he deserve what he got? from the individual who gave it to him, given the individual's previous actions, behaviour and manner? But what I would say is that actually what Dr Clark said was no different to what Dr Bloomfield had said only 48 hours before. Yeah, we've all that's correct, that but it's Dr Clark saying it. Well, again, repeating only what Dr Bloomfield has said, this is not, no one here is placing blame in any individual's foot for something that was a systems failure and that we are all working really well collectively together to resolve. You don't think it was galling that the most inept minister going was the one handing out the criticism? Again, you'll see that I've kind of disputed the framing that you've put around this whole thing, Mike. Again, none of us are placing blame at individuals here because that wouldn't be right. Um, We have had a system failure. We've worked hard to fix it. The report yesterday shows the efforts that have been made. And I will just say this. Both Dr. Bloomfield and Dr. Clark have worked together exceptionally well. I've sit in meetings with these individuals frequently. I know the collaborative, collegial working relationship that they have. And those two individuals are part of a bigger team who have managed to get New Zealand in an unenviable position. We are, we are doing better than most of the world right now. And it is because, and not in small part, to the work that they've been doing alongside New Zealanders. Do the Greens universal wage have any chance of getting up and seeing the light of day in government, do you think? Oh, one thing I would say, look, we, we share a view around needing to deal with income inadequacy. So that, that's where we have some shared view. Uh, I have seen, you know, some first cuts of, of the policy. One thing I would say, very, it is much easier to calculate with some level of uh, certainty money going out the door. It is much more difficult with some certainty to make assumptions around tax revenue with changes like this. So I think that there are some assumptions in there that I think I would question. Appreciate your time. Jacinda Ardern, the Prime Minister, 17 past 7. The Prime